Very nice to be here. Uh, this is the I go home tomorrow, so this is a very nice way to finish this. Um, um, I'm going to read this is a, just a tiny bit from the, the Irish Times, the paper that I, that I used to work for, and to a very occasion we still give the art piece for. And it concerns the trial of a man named Lee Crow. And Lee Crow was on trial in Dublin for walking into a party at a, 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 in Clonmel in County Tipperary with a shotgun, and he killed one man and injured a woman. And um, this is the police man of the guard This is the guard of Sergeant giving evidence of Lee Crow's trial. Sergeant O'Reardon said that when Crow was interviewed, he asked Gardy what evidence they had against him. They told him he'd been identified at the scene. Crow replied, that's bullshit, nobody saw me, I had on balaclava and gloves. Now, I, <laughs> I raise this only to point out a number of things. Uh, first, it explains why it's so difficult to write crime fiction set in Ireland, because uh, you can see at that level of criminality, you're really, you're really barely above the idiot level. Really, there, are, there are things in ponds that are better criminals than any criminals. Um, but it's like, that's my background was writing crime fiction, that's what I began doing, it was the thing that I loved. And you can make a very nice living writing crime fiction over and over, because basically people who like genre fiction tend to like the same thing every time but a little bit different. That's the that's you succeed, that's what you do. You know, they get used to having their things of a particular character or a particular hero, or whatever it may be, um, every time, each year. And readers of genre fiction tend to they tend to develop an affection not for writers but for characters. If you think about it, we, you know, you read Patricia Caldwell for Case Scarpetta, and she's got an interesting example of uh, of somebody who kind of began very interestingly, you know, who very, pretty much invented a subgenre, that idea of uh, a crime being investigated through the medium of the human body, which I hadn't really been done before, and it, I doubt it was a very female way of examining a crime. Maybe they're kind of Swedish and things like that, but not very good with that. Uh, she was right. And then there's been the kind of slow deterioration over the last few years, you know, certainly over the last decade, and, and yet we still, people still go buy the latest British Cornwall book because we think, oh, we don't want to have our friends tell us, actually, that one's very good. You know, because then if your friend has one up on you and you get bitter and you fall out, you know, it's just it's the way people work. Um, so you read it and then you think, actually, it wasn't very good. You know, and you keep hoping that the books are going to get better. Uh, because essentially readers are optimists. They kind of think, oh, it wasn't very good, we'll buy the next one. That has to get better sometime. It's actually like having um, having a relative in a coma, and you know when they tell you to go to the hospital and talk to them every weekend, you know, and you think, they can't hear me. They're, Hello, Gran, are you in there? And there's not much happening, you know? And readers have been kind of conducting that level of deathbed vigil for Patricia Cornwell for about the last decade. <laughs> you know, you keep looking for signs of life and it's not really coming. Oh, well, the last book was that. Um, it's, it's kind of damning with faint praise, isn't it? That was, I, well, it was, it was. It was a marked improvement on The Strange One with the Dwarf in it, which was just really bizarre. Um, it, was, it was very odd. I mean, people read that book, I think it was, it was, it was Scarpetta had a dwarf in it. And at one point, it's pointed out that the dwarf is actually quite well endowed for a dwarf. And, and as a reader, you pause at that point and think, what is, is this going to have something very important to do with the plot later? You know, is, is at some point the dwarfs, you know, bandits, are they going to be proved to be crucial to the plot? You know, is it a, a, kind of a penis ex machina, I suppose. <laughs> um, and then they know that, well, it is, it's completely irrelevant, but there you go. It, it, the, the dwarf didn't really have anything to do with the So, this is a roundabout way of getting to, to the point of this matter, which is that, as a writer, you can, like I said, you can make a pretty good living writing the same book over and over again. Your publishers and, and some of your readers will get very annoyed when you go and do other things. But you will stagnate as a writer if you keep doing the same book year after year after year. You'll make money from readers, and you'll disappoint them occasionally, but because they're quite loyal, they're probably not going to, to go off and, and see other writers. You know, they'll still, they may fit in a writer on the side and not tell you about it, you know? <laughs> Sneak off in afternoons when you're working and meet somebody else. But you know, by and large, they're going to stick with you until the end. Um, and that's a, that's a difficult choice for a writer to make, because you, you sacrifice, you will sacrifice sales, you will annoy your readers by going and doing other things. I never really signed on just to write crime novels. I love writing them. But I thought one way of keeping the crime novels fresh was to occasionally go and do other things. And 
For a long time, I'd been fascinated by fairy tales and folk tales. And I thought, they're really important. Um, we're going to kind of come on to this in a minute. They're, they're really, they have a resonance that goes beyond the fact that we tell them to little children. Um, and they have a real depth to them. Um, and I also want to write about childhood. I've always described the Book of Lost Things as a book about childhood for adults. It is a book filled with regret. It is a book that looks back. And yet, teenagers who've read it come to it with a very different ethos because they're, they're going through all of those things at the time. Uh, I remember reading in Arizona last year, I was reading from a, a book called The Gates, which is very much a kid's book, so I was, in, I was at school. And a girl I called you after, she was probably about 14, and uh, she had a copy, a really battered copy of The Book of Lost Things. And I said, oh, you know, that's the Book of Lost Things. And she said, she said, yeah, she said, I read it, I read it over the last six months, she said, but my mum died about five months ago. And you kind of want to hug it. It's not that I was like, I'm sorry for the kids in American schools, I'll still be in jail. But you know, you, you, uh, but you do, you have that urge to kind of go, because it's not in the order of things for a child to lose a parent, but it happens. And it's part of that darkness of the world that occasionally encroaches upon children's lives. And I also want to write about the power of books, uh, because David at the start of the book is me as a child. You know, I lived in a house with my grandparents and my parents. We had three generations in one small house. And when you live, some of you probably have grown up in a house where there's lots of people in it for a couple of generations. You need to carve out a space for yourself because otherwise you go mad. You know, you need a space that's yours. And my father eventually got our attic converted. And my brother and I ended up sure, uh, had adjoining rooms in the attic. And my rooms just filled with books. That was the space that I had carved out. And so I became one of those kids who sees the world through books. That was my way of understanding the world, through books and stories. And so all of those things began to feed into this book that I wanted to write. 